My guest today represents to many a transgenerational fight for freedom and sovereignty in a country that has experienced everything but that over the last 40 years. Ahmad Massoud, leader of the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan, thank you very much for joining us here on Euronews. As we speak today, your country has gone through seismic changes after 20 years of foreign troops' presence. Afghanistan is now once again in the hands of the Taliban. Your life has been appended. Your province, Panjshir, has officially been taken by the Taliban. Do you remember where you were on August 15, 2021, what you were doing that day? I was in Kabul. I stayed in Kabul till the very last moment. I stayed in Kabul and many people, they stayed in Kabul with one hope. Despite everything, we were hoping for a peaceful transition. A peaceful transition from the Republic of Afghanistan, slowly, slowly, a peaceful transition to a situation for an interim government, which provides situation for peace and dialogue, and then maybe another election or a new government, that the Taliban can be a part of it, uh, or so on. However, unfortunately, the collapse of the government, the miscalculation, and the intention of Taliban for not solving the problem of Afghanistan through peace and dialogue and wasting time, and to take it with, through the battle of gun, it ended in that catastrophe. And I believe you tried to negotiate yes. with the Taliban, much like yes. your father did in the past. Yeah. And I understand that they offered you a position yeah. in their government. Can you tell us more about that? When I went to Panjshir Valley, uh, I decided, because one thing was very clear, the Taliban was uh, advertising and saying that Mr. Ghani did not want peace. Even to the opposition of Mr. Ghani, which we were, and I was not happy with the way Mr. Ghani was governing, and I knew that his way of governing will result to the collapse, which we all saw it was true. I thought maybe this is the fault of Ghani that the peace negotiation didn't work. So now that the opportunity came to us that we could represent our own people, then I started the path for dialogue, negotiation, and talk first. For this matter, we put few efforts. First and foremost, I thought that maybe the Taliban, that they are speaking of Sharia, they speak of Islam, they speak of religion. The scholars of Afghanistan can be the good ambassadors to, you know, to, and, and the mediators. And I asked them, I asked the ambassadors, the scholars, to be the ambassador, to be the mediator. And they, they tried their hardest. But unfortunately, the Taliban did not listen to them. Second, I thought maybe the scholars uh, were not very diplomatic or were not very effective. A delegation, a political delegation was sent to them. No result, they refused. And then I thought maybe I should do it myself directly. I spoke with different people of Taliban for maybe I can find a way to stop the violence and start peace. Who did you speak to? Can you share that with us? I spoke with Mr. Muttaqi, I spoke with Shalah Shahabuddin Dulawar, I spoke with Mr. Ghiyas, I spoke with Mr. Anas Haqqani, I spoke with Mr. Khalil Haqqani. Because one thing is that I know there's divisions within the Taliban. So when sometimes I used to talk with one side, they were saying, no, it is not us, it is the other group. When I asked, used to talk to other groups, say, no, it is not us fighting, it's the other group. But unfortunately, this hypocrisy was always within it. A couple of days after the fall of Kabul from Panjshir, you penned an op-ed for the Washington Post, and I quote, I am ready to follow in my father's footsteps. Mujahideen fighters are prepared to once again take on the Taliban. We have stores of ammunition and arms that we have collected since my father's time. What happened to that pledge, to that fight today? Where does the resistance stand as we speak today? As we are speaking, the resistance is something that the Taliban denied time after time. We see that we managed to capture them, we managed to even take down uh, their helicopters, we managed to survive the harsh winters of Hindu Kush, we managed to survive with zero help from outside. Is that a choice or, or, or is, the, is the international community simply not paying attention to your cause? So no uh, sane mind will say that no, we don't need anything. Of course we need support, of course we need help, but the thing is that 
I still strongly believe that we need to come, all of us, a collective uh, team, the international community alongside the Afghan elites who are not happy with the current situation, to truly find path for the future of Afghanistan. So you're basically seeking an Afghan solution for Afghanistan. Absolutely, yeah. The United States said you wanted to end its endless war. But that war, the war against terror, is far from over. Absolutely. We have uh, seen what's happening in the region. You have warned about the dangers of yeah. the return of the Taliban with yeah. regards to that aspect. You have mentioned before that Al-Qaeda is operating in your country and that perhaps other groups are being harbored inside Afghanistan by the Taliban. Why do you think the world is simply not listening to that? Why is nobody doing anything? Well, I think there's two reasons for it. We are not living in the same world as 2001. We are living in a world that uh, the national interest right now is uh, far more important than the global interest that used to be important in 2001. The people used to think long term than short term. And I believe few things truly changed it. First, uh, at that time, the generation who were closer to the, to the experiences or to the era of post-World War II remembered and understood the importance of fighting for freedom and democracy. And they really didn't take freedom, democracy, and what the, the, the modern world for granted. They knew the blood was, was spilled and the blood we sacrificed for having this. That's why the world stood with the people of Afghanistan through the Soviet invasion. The world stood with Afghanistan against fighting against terrorism. But past 20 years, especially the new generations, I believe, and the new phases, it brought a little of change, especially in the Europe, that we took everything for granted. The, the life, the democracy, the freedom, and we forgot the evil that we all as humanity sacrificed a lot to defeat it. So that is one thing. It's my personal experience living in Europe for, for many, many years. Second thing was the past 20 years of war in Afghanistan that the world put all their efforts in the past 20 years to do something, but they failed. And now they think that there is no hope. However, it's still Afghanistan is savable, but not for long. How does one save Afghanistan? What needs to happen to save your country? I believe that the world must stand firm against the Taliban and the Taliban demands. And the world as a collective uh, group needs to together, not individually engaging with the Taliban, collectively engage with Afghanistan, all you know, sides of it, all uh, parties of it, all uh, types of and sectors of it, to truly find a solution for Afghanistan, the political solution or like you know, a process to prepare the situation for Afghanistan for a legitimate government. Why it will work now? Because of a few reasons. First, the Taliban, after one year of them being in power, they truly showed that they are not able to govern. Secondly, the people realized at the beginning there were a lot of people hopeful. They even called the Taliban 2.0, moderate Taliban, but we saw it was all fake. They are the same. Thirdly, there are some internal division within the Taliban. There are some groups who are not happy with the situation, but they are in the minority. And lastly, the thing about it is that some of the other countries which was against the presence of American international forces in Afghanistan, and for that reason they were supporting Taliban, are not doing so now. So therefore this is an opportunity that can lead to success. Why my father, when he came in France in 2001, he strongly uh, suggested the support for uh, the Afghan government at that time and fighting against the terrorism without the presence of uh, international forces because he knew the international presence in Afghanistan, international forces presence in Afghanistan, it will make Afghanistan sort of a battleground for the other rivals because we all know that a lot of superpowers, they, you know, uh, they don't like each other, they have their own games, uh, uh, their agendas. When their presence in, in one country, the other country will 
do anything and empower another enemies and to do something against it. Now that the international presence, uh, forces presence in Afghanistan is, is zero, therefore the opportunity is there for an effort together and put every pressure for it. And above all, the people, new generation, especially women, they don't want this situation to continue. So we will prevail, we will succeed, but we need the world's attention and support now before it becomes too late. You mentioned your father, yeah. who remains an extraordinary symbol <clears throat> of a fight on behalf of values that you said to yourself, your country shares with the West. Yeah. Do you think that if he was alive today, things would be different? Absolutely. If he was alive, first and foremost, at his time, with his capability and his capacity and everything that he had, he was a legitimate government and uh, he was a military genius person. Uh, he knew at the very latest stage of his life and his struggle against the Taliban. In different meetings, especially with the, with the press and also when he had a trip to the Europe, he mentioned that the Taliban no longer have the capacity and capability to defeat us militarily. So at the last year of his life, he knew that militarily he will not be defeated. That is why his trip to Europe was to open a new phase for a new era, a new sort of uh, pa um, process, just like as I am speaking, for all sides to come together to form a new government in Afghanistan. He did not want to go and capture Kabul and to establish his own government. He was not after that. He was the resisting basically till all the diaspora of Afghans they are ready and they get together and they are a part of a process of establishing a government that all can accept and can, uh, can agree on. And this is what he was doing and he was able to, you know, to sustain it, but the Taliban knew it, the Al-Qaeda knew it, and the others, that if he's alive, we will not be successful. And Al-Qaeda knew that if he's alive, we will not be able to, you know, to even harm the West and any other country. So, they eliminated him, and then they attacked the Twin Towers. If Ahmad Shah Massoud was not being uh, eliminated and, and, and assassinated, the, uh, the tragedy of 9-11 uh, would not happen, and we would not be in this situation at all. What kind of father was Ahmad Shah Massoud? What do you remember of him? I remember his kindness. I remember his uh, being a very uh, strict teacher. Um, teaching me uh, art, teaching me uh, poetry, and teaching me literature. He loved the Persian literature, he loved uh, uh, Sufism poetry, and uh, uh, he was a very strong man. And he had that sort of charisma in him, he had that sort of the, uh, atmosphere around him, that when you were with him, you would be feel calm, that oh, nothing is going to happen, he's here. I remember a very hard times came and Panjshir was completely surrounded by the Taliban. They came and they wanted to capture. It was a very, very difficult time. But the people in Panjshir, they were happy, they were smiling. I was like, why? Uh, they had a sort of expression, Omar Saibas, it means he's here. They're like, oh, he's here. He will sort it out. If he managed to defeat the Russians, surely he can you know, withstand all this pressure. He was like that. He was a beacon of hope, he was a beacon of love, and he was very kind and he was very moderate. You were 12 when you lost your dad. Your family has suffered yeah. immensely, I imagine. Your life has nothing of an ordinary man your age. Why do you still do this? Is this still worth fighting? Before our interview, you mentioned something about Afghanistan, that you fell in love with Afghanistan instantly. Well, I'm from that land <laughs> and have been uh, blessed, some people they call it cursed, but I truly feel it blessed to be born in that land, uh, to be born with that people. And uh, truly, the people they deserve dying for. Ahmad Masood, thank you thank very you much so. for thank speaking you very to much your news.